Hey there, it's been a while. Um, before we get into the episode, I just want to quickly acknowledge up at the top that at some point Jake will mention that the conversation you are about to hear was recorded in December of 2020. <laughs> Today it is September 5th, 2021. So it took us a full, like, nine months to get this one to you because we, uh, um, were when, um, it was, listen, uh, Synecdoche, New York is largely about how time can just slip right past you, so let's pretend that with the release schedule of this episode, we were just trying to be uh, thematic. Moving forward, we're going to try really hard to get first film back onto a regular release schedule, but right now, without further ado, uh, please enjoy our conversation about Charlie Kaufman's Synecdoche, New York. See, because we can, we can achieve perfection if we want to. We can achieve perfection. <laughs> Every day we, we choose. choose not to. We choose to stray further from God's light. Um, hi, welcome back. You're listening to First Film. My name is Jake Berkowitz. My name is Dan Feingold. And today we're going to be ta t talking about tackling one Senor Charles, what's his middle name? <laughs> Stuart Kaufman. <laughs> Uh, we've been gone for a bit, but happy to be back. Um, we're recording this around Christmas time. Uh, how you been, Dan? I've been fine. I've been. How you been, Jake? I've been. I've been. <laughs> it was a really bad decision to have the how you been talk off mic, because now I have nothing to say well, to you. Well, also, it wasn't particularly uplifting. It's probably best that we did not put it on the podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, shit <laughs> still sucks. Um, this is a film podcast where we talk about a director's filmography, specifically through the lens of their first film. Since we're talking about Charlie Kaufman, things are going to be a little funky, considering he's probably most famous as a writer, but we are looking at Synecdoche, which is his debut as a director. Um, Dan, yeah. your experience with Philip Seymour Hoffman Kaufman. <laughs> Philip Seymour Kaufman. Yeah. Um, I love Charlie Kaufman so much. Yeah, you picked and him. And I have ever since I was like in high school and I watched... Which is the age when you first discover like <laughs> Eternal Sunshine. Yeah, yeah, it was probably Eternal Sunshine. And he was the first writer who I was ever a fan of. Like, obviously, actors are out there, directors yeah, you are very them. famous. And this was before he had directed anything. I believe. No, maybe it wasn't, because by 2008 he had. Already. I was going to say, Synecdoche was, I think, 2008 or But I hadn't seen Synecdoche until much later. Um, and I, I just really fell in love with, like, yeah, the ways that he wrote movies, and it just, like, broke my brain apart and really expanded my view of, like, what, what you can even can do with the movie. I was going to say, I can't imagine what your experience with Charlie Kaufman would be if your first Kaufman film was Synecdoche. It would be more negative. I don't yeah, think. it's hard to approach, like, his filmography through the lens of Synecdoche as your entry point, but we're going to do that today. Yeah, because when I first watched Synecdoche, maybe this is jumping the gun a little bit, but I did not love it the first time I watched it. Oh yeah, me neither. The first time I saw it, I'm like, this is good, but it takes more than one viewing to totally wrap your wrap your tiny little hands around it, your grubby little <laughs> your, fingies your, around your it, and be like, hands. I get it. Um, yeah, I think the first Kaufman film I saw was also probably Eternal Sunshine. I'm trying to think. I think, yeah, I think Eternal Sunshine was the first, and I'm like, God, this is so good. I hadn't seen it since high school. This rewatching was the first time I had seen it since high school. And I was like, is this going to be one of those movies where you watch it when you're a high schooler and you're I like, wow, this blows my mind. It, it was so meaningful to me when I first watched it. And I was like, I need this to be good. <laughs> I rewatched. It's not like it was not that movie for me where it like, really, for me, that movie was, we already talked about Moonrise Kingdom. That mm -hmm. really was like, wow, movies can do whatever you want them to do. So Eternal Sunshine was just a movie I really dug when I saw it in high school. I watched it again. Like this week's, maybe we're jump. I'm jumping the gun again, but like, nah, that shit slaps. It was better than I remember. It, honestly, <laughs> like I'm like the idiot Jacob in high school didn't even fucking get it. I get it. No, this Eternal, is for me. Eternal Sunshine is great. I mean, they're all they're all. I mm. I love. All, I had seen all of them except for Human Nature and Confessions Con of a Dangerous Confessions Mind. Of a dangerous I hadn't mind. seen those either. And if you're gonna skip two of them, it should be those two. Those two are like the redheaded stepchildren the of the Charlie thing, Kaufman. Okay, movies. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind is directed by George Clooney. George Clooney. It was his first film. It was was, it's not great. And I think that is the one where Charlie Kaufman has like, the least I... control because he was a producer on all the movies that he wrote except for that one. He also said that like and Clooney it shows. cut some stuff and he's, he, he did he's some rewrites so, that, that he said Charlie that he Kaufman doesn't, did not bless. Yeah. Um, and it shows because that, uh, I mean, we're once again jumping the gun, um, is probably his like, it has, I remember what I was watching Confessions of Dangerous Mind and it was like, 
what's the point of this? Like, there's no core. It to doesn't that movie. feel Kaufman esque at all. It well, not that it doesn't feel Kaufman esque. It it could have been like a a fucking what's his name, uh, Charlie Kaufman's fake stepbrother in an adaptation. Oh, uh, D- Donald. Yeah, it could have been a Donald Kaufman movie, but it <laughs> yes. wasn't even that. That's so true. It, there's just nothing <laughs> at the core. It's not about anything. It's ostensibly about this guy, but so fucking it, what? It plays with the themes of synecdoche a little bit in the very first opening monologue. Yeah, a little bit where he's like, I'm a coward and then but like then, that's then not addressed in any way yeah, for the rest, the, the rest of the rest film of the he's not a side. coward at and all. human nature is more of a charlie Kaufman human nature movie. i dug human nature it, i actually I enjoyed have some it points I, to I didn't okay it's not it. my favorite uh, yeah, yeah but it's like a good early michel gondry film and it's a good early kaufman film yeah it like it's funny it's fine it's funny it's fine yeah <laughs> human nature all right um, bio time yeah, I think so, because we talked about our... Like, I had seen basically every film except for Human Nature and Confessions of a Dangerous Mind coming yep. into the same spot. Same exact um, same. Dan, this is your baby. Charlie Kaufman is your baby. Charlie Kaufman is my father. So, so why don't you tell us about your dad, bio. Daddy Kaufman. My dad, Charles Stuart Kaufman, was born November 19th, 1958, to a Jewish family in Massapequa, New York. That makes so, so much far, sense. So far, this could actually easily be my dad. Massapequa <laughs> is like 20 minutes away. Also, if you told me anything other than he was a Jew from Long Island, I would not believe you. That scans 100%. Um, his dad, Myron, was an engineer, and his mother, Helen, was a homemaker. As a kid, Kaufman frequently staged plays at his parents' uh, how, at, at his house, uh, and he enjoyed making short movies on his Super 8 camera. Uh, at some point, his family moved to Connecticut, where he would attend Hall High School. During his time in high school, Kaufman studied TV production, did improv, and was very active in his school's drama club. Was this like a like a really nice? What, did you did you happen to get what kind of high school this was? I couldn't get a lot of details about the high school, so I I don't know if this was like a fancy a performing arts high school, school or something. Because I'm like he. Focused on like TV production in high school. What the fuck kind you of? You want to say we this? pause and Google Hall High School? See sure, let's find? look up Hall High School. See what kind of high school he was rocking. <laughs> After extensive research, we have determined that Hall it took High 30 School. Thirty seconds. It was a public school. Yeah, I mean, send your kids to Connecticut public schools. They sound really solid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so he, he was involved in TV, TV production, improv, uh, and he was active in his school's drama club. Yeah, that makes sense. In his senior year, he landed the lead role in his school's production of Play It Again, Sam. Oh my god, I know what Charlie Kaufman looks like, and I know how fucking short he is. So, I mean, you said <laughs> leading, and I'm like, there's no way he's a good leading man. But Play It Again, Sam is a Woody Allen play. It's a Woody Allen movie, so of course he would be the yeah. Woody Allen oh. character. That makes perfect sense. That it's definitely the only checks kind of out. leading role he could ever land. <laughs> At this point in his life, Kaufman thought that he would grow up to be an actor. Oh. oh. Ooh. When he graduated, he received his school's Diane T. Weldon Scholarship for Achievement in Dramatic Arts. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is, but it sounded pretty impressive. Well, if I'm not mistaken, he did have a career in theater. Like, he's written plays. I'm pretty sure Anomalisa started as a play. It started no? as a play, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there was Anomalisa, and it, I think it's called Death Leaves the Theater. Which... I don't know what that is. Yeah, it was like some collaboration between him and the Coen brothers, where they both wrote like short plays. Holy shit! I had a hard time finding them online, but the the scripts, or is it like the, a... the plays themselves? Oh, okay, yeah. You found them? I I listened to a little bit of it. I don't because I, I didn't listen to the whole thing. Okay, because it was just the audio, and I was like, this is not, not really the it. full experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. So he he has worked in theater a lot. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, that makes sense. Th- that's where he started out. He he wrote like sketches and and short plays when he was a kid and in high school. Okay. Yeah. So after high school, Kaufman attended Boston University. Okay. However, he hated it and immediately <laughs> transferred to NYU. That makes sense. I was gonna say my cousin went to BU. I don't know anyone who went to NYU Tisch, but. Yeah, that makes sense. He would go there. And NYU is where he changed his mind about being an actor and decided to study film production. Some of his classmates included Chris Columbus and future collaborator Paul Proch. I don't know who Paul Proch is, but I know Christopher Columbus, auteur director of Pixels. Um, and Harry Home Potter. Alone and Harry right? Potter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the guy. Um, 
Well, Proach and Kaufman became good friends, and the two both wrote for the National Lampoon and worked together on multiple unproduced scripts. Aww. Aww, sad. Sad. I, sad. I would love to see what those scripts look like, like early baby Kaufman. I, I imagine they're not good. A little bit about, like, the concept of an unproduced script that Kaufman wrote that we'll okay. get to soon. Okay. Um, after college, Kaufman moved to Minneapolis and worked Where? for th- Minneapolis. Minneapolis? Min- mini- Minneapolis. What am I saying? You're saying Minneapolis. Okay, well, I'm mid-stroke right now. So. <laughs> damn, damn! Uh, Minneapolis, excuse me. I don't know why he moved to Minneapolis. Yeah, I can't imagine, like, the Coen brothers grew up there, but I don't imagine that's why he went. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really get anything about, like, his relationship with his wife, but my theory is that that's where his wife lived. Oh, okay, I was gonna say, was he married at this point? I don't know when he got married. <laughs> this is a comprehensive <laughs> bio. <laughs> Listen, I think everyone we've talked to has had a wedding at some point, and you didn't mention it once. So uh, you're right. How you're am right. I going to get roasted for this? Because I can. In Minneapolis, he worked for the Star Tribune and at the Art Institute. He was the guy who said, The museum will be closing in 15 minutes. He and Proach continued what? to tickle. Oh, no, 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 What the fuck does that mean? That was part of his job. He announced that the museum would be closing. <laughs> Why is that a notable thing that's available for you to know? If you're wondering, which our audience is wondering, what he did... At the Art Institute. But why is that information available to you online? Charlie Kaufman doesn't like to talk about his personal life. But that information's out there. What is out there is, like, kind of sparse and often very strange. So I just... Listen, I'm doing my best here. I I trust you. He and Proach continued to collaborate at this time, writing multiple television spec scripts. Again, none of which were produced. Ah, rip. In 1991, Kaufman moved to L.A. during hiring season, but he was unsuccessful in his efforts to, you know, get hired. That sucks for him. (laughs) That sucks for everyone who passed on him, but... (laughs) True, true. Well, finally, a show called Access America, which was based back in Minneapolis, reached out to him and offered him a job. Okay. Kaufman was a little bit disappointed that he couldn't get hired in L.A., but since this was better than nothing, he decided to to sign on. Yeah. Yep. However, right before he he packed his bags and actually drove back home, a man named David Merkin told him not to go, but didn't give him a solid... What? (laughs) Don't go. (laughs) But he didn't give him a solid job offer either. Yeah, of course, so I'm assuming he went. So Kaufman was like, okay, Mr. Merkin. No, (laughs) And he just sort of hung around until Merkin made good, uh, and he did uh, hire Charlie Kaufman to write for the show Get a Life. I've never heard of this show. Yeah, there are a lot of weird shows that I hadn't heard of either. Um, well, after that, writing jobs became steady, and at okay. this time, he wrote for various comedy shows, including The Edge and The Dana Carvey Show. I do know The Dana Carvey Show. Which is the one show. that I have heard of. Because I remember reading, like, stories about that stacked writer's room. Like, apparently, it was, like, him and, uh, I forget who else. I think, like, Stephen Colbert was on that show writing. Interesting. I didn't know that. And, like, I think a bunch of, like, really well well known and acclaimed writers were in like a season of the Dana Carvey show if I'm not mistaken I think uh I, I don't know I'd have to look this up yeah I was surprised to learn like how how much Kaufman's background was in comedy before he had done any movies yeah I mean it that makes, was surprising to me I was gonna say it makes sense. it also does make sense and because yeah. his movies even when they're very dark are actually really fucking funny yeah they are hilarious. they are hilarious and there are moments that I didn't even appreciate the first time that I watched so many of them that I'm sure we'll get to eventually yes okay so the writer's room for the Dana Carvey show included Steve Carell Louis C.K., who, I mean, problematic, but when he was young, was funny. Um, I mean, Dana Carvey himself, um, Stephen Colbert, Charlie Kaufman, um, Bob Odenkirk. That's All of incredible. these guys were in I the writer's room of the Dana Carvey a show. a moment of the Dana Carvey show. Me Have neither. You? I no, check no, it out. absolutely not. But, like, those are... Big names in comedy. They had them all. That's kind of a dream team. Yeah. I mean, a a nightmare team in 2020 in in many respects, but... (laughs) For one of those guys. (laughs) In terms of comedy writing, yeah. Very solid. Um, So, Kaufman also continued to write many pilots of his own, and although they sometimes got positive attention, none of them were picked up. Yeah. They were, as you can imagine, extremely weird. One of them (laughs) was called Rambling Pants, and it was about a bad poet who was named Pants. (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, ab- I do like this. Apparently there is a lot of singing in this. I love it. I, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I get the feeling that he... that like every three lines there is a song. <laughs> Absurd. Can't be made. I don't know why he thought it could be made, but I have a feeling that Charlie Kaufman secretly really loves musical theater. 
Yeah I, uh, yeah, I mean, he for sure loves theater in general. I would not be surprised. Well, he writes the lyrics for a lot of the songs in that are films? in his movies. Is I, that news to you? Yeah. I did not know that he was writing the lyrics, but that makes sense. I mean, even still, like, Oklahoma is central to, the musical Oklahoma is central to I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Right, so right. So the guy yeah, true, true. does at least have a, a respect for musical theater, if he's not in love with it. But the fact that he wanted to write a musical show, God, I love Charlie Kaufman, yeah. and I hope he makes a musical Well, the, the end credits that they use for Synecdoche, New York, are, are, are really, really him, beautiful, yeah. and he wrote the lyrics. I'm just a little person one person in a sea of many little and also Anomalisa has I think multiple songs that he's written lyrics for well I know he wrote the lyrics for Cindy Lauper's uh <laughs> yeah he fun. ghost writ- wrote, wrote for, for Cindy, for Cindy Lauper for sure Sometime in the 90s, whatever show Kaufman was working on got cancelled, and with his newfound free time, he began working on a movie script that was to be about uh, a man who falls in love with someone who is not his wife. Okay, that sounds like a basic, could be any number of the movies he made. Eventually, this would become Being John Malkovich. Okay, there you go. John Malkovich got a hold of the script, and he liked it a lot, and... Good Many producers Malkovich. were also pretty interested in it, but for a long time, no one was brave enough to actually finance it. Of course, because it's fucking bananas. Because it's insane. Um, eventually, though, the script was bought by a production company owned by R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe. And, oh, shit! Yeah, and after <laughs> five years, uh, production on Being John Malkovich finally began. There you go. Uh, it was a huge success, yes. and he followed it up by writing Human Nature, Adaptation, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the latter earning him his first Oscar. I'm pretty sure a couple were nominated. I know... Yeah, there were... No- Human Nature... No, no, uh, maybe Human Nature, but I know that being John Malkovich, he was nominated for, yeah, and I think I Adaptation... I don't think Human Nature was the one. I think Human Nature was the one he was not yeah, no, nominated for. I'm pretty for. sure it was being John Malkovich and, and Adaptation. Adaptation, they nominated a fictional character for... <laughs> yeah, for they nominated uh, him and Donald Kaufman best for Best yeah, Writing. His fictional brother. Which, oh man, if only Donald Kaufman didn't die in that fucking swamp in Florida. <laughs> Imagine me and you. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, Jim Carrey's character in Eternal Sunshine is partially based on uh, Kaufman's buddy, Paul Proch. Oh, and Proch's art, art appears in the movie. Oh, that's... Well, I, I honestly thought that was Jim Carrey, because I know Jim Carrey can draw. I don't know if, I he was, was Jim, if Jim Carrey art. was doing painting at that time. I feel like Jim Carrey started doing visual art, like, relatively recently. I don't know about that. I just assumed it was Carrey's, but, oh, man, Kaufman's bro is sad. Yeah, sad I'm, boy. I, I guess so. I guess it does... It is pretty revealing about <laughs> That does not speak Proch. well of... Well, I mean, Kaufman's movies never speak well of him, to either. To be honest, though, Joel in Eternal Sunshine is kind of a blank slate. So I'm not sure... I don't know That's if it says true. anything about Proach. That's <laughs> Other true. Other than that, he's sad when he gets he's broken, broken up, up with. with. He can be sad sometimes. <laughs> um, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, we just went, um, yeah, with the exact same we have to kiss now. <laughs> Finally, Kaufman decided to do a bit of a tone switch and write a horror movie, but not a horror movie about murderers or monsters. This was to be a horror movie about subjects that were actually scary to him and that were realistic. It's Women. about a, it's, <laughs> it, it's a movie about aging, about loneliness, uh, and about the unknowable consequences of all of our choices. And about women. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Spike Jones was originally slated to direct it, but when he dropped out due to scheduling conflicts, Charlie Kaufman himself stepped in, making Synecdoche, New York, his directorial debut. I was gonna ask, like, what prompted the man to step out from behind the writer's desk and step behind the camera? Like, because his collaborations with Spike Jones and Michel Gondry had been so fruitful. I was curious, like, yeah. why he was like, I I need to have full control over this. Because it seemed like, especially with, I mean, the film he made right before um, uh, Synecdoche was Eternal Sunshine, which was, I mean, his most critically acclaimed and I'm assuming financially successful. So, and I know he had like a really good working relationship with Michel Gondry. They like collaborated while they were making the film together. And a lot of that movie was improv. So I was <laughs> curious like why he was like, 
I need to direct this one. Yeah, well, Spike Jones, like I said, was originally going to. I yeah. don't know about Michel Gondry, but like you said, his working relationship with those people while they were directing his movies was very hands-on. Yeah. So I think after, what is this, like four or five films? Yeah. Where he's, except for uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, where he's kinda, on yeah. set every day. And you see that in adaptation. Yeah. He's on set, on set. of being John Malkovich. So I think well, after Nick all Cage that, is on set of being John Malkovich. At playing Charlie yes, Kaufman. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I think after all that, he just, he felt like he was ready. He was ready. Yeah. I would agree I, that he was I think ready. his assessment was correct. He was yeah, ready. Yeah, he was 100% ready. Okay, just quick correction corner. Uh, Charlie Kaufman's play was called Hope Leaves the Theater. Okay. And it was actually a radio play. So it okay. is, it is so just audio. So it's meant audio. to be heard. Yeah. What did you say? I said Death, Death Leaves, Leaves the, the Theater. theater. Okay. Hope Leaves the Theater, I think, is a light, slightly more ominous than Death Leaves the Theater. Death is right, Death Leaves the Theater would actually be a positive message. That's yeah. like, good, Hope we got that guy out of here. <laughs> is not great ever. Yeah. Um, Dan, would you be so brave as to offer up a plot summary for Synecdoche, New York? Synecdoche, New York is about a theater director named Caden Cotard. Yes. Played by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Rest in peace. He's so fucking good in this. Uh, yeah, he really... It, it's yeah I, everyone is Kath, Catherine Keener so good also Kathy, amazing. Kathy Kathy <laughs> Kathy's at my house <laughs> um, um yeah. yeah so he is a theater director he is worried about his health he's like in his 40s he gets a MacArthur grant to make any type of theater production that he wants yes. he decides to build a replica of New York City um and just make it a play about his life and about about real life, life, and it eventually it spirals out of control, and it just becomes about everyone, and the, the warehouse housing the theater just becomes like a replica of New York within New York with a warehouse inside, inside of it, it. And because in, or, in order for this to be honest, yeah, yeah. it has to include itself, um, and it just spirals out of control. And his life kind of also spirals, spirals out of control. His wife leaves him prior and takes his daughter. He loses prior touch with to his him. daughter. He yeah. gets remarried. He's unhappy. He finds the love of his life. We're gonna spoil it. She instantly dies as soon as they get back together because they were together at one point. But he cried during the sex. house is on fire. Charlie Kaufman will not tell us why. <laughs> I was gonna say I have so many notes about this film, but the one thing that like I could not even provide a base good answer to me was why is the house on fire? Well, I have a theory. My, I, I do have a theory too. I want to hear yours. <laughs> well, uh, th so the character's name is Hazel. Yes. Hazel buys a, a house that's on fire. That is on fire. She lives in it her whole life and yeah. eventually towards the end of the movie it she dies her. in it. I think the house the fire is, uh, I mean, it's a pretty sophomoric observation but I think the fire is death yeah. and the, the, house, yeah, 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 for the sure. house is our bodies. You know, okay. we are living in in a in a in a, in a vessel that is breaking us. down, yes. that is being destroyed every day, and we have no choice but to live in it and eventually perish. Yeah, I mean, I do like that observation because so much of this movie is about like Philip Seymour Hoff, not Philip Seymour Hoffman, Jesus Christ, Charlie Kaufman does have an obsession with bodies in so many of his movies, mm -hmm. like. Even from being John Malkovich, like, people are going to die and they try to find... The reason that these portals exist into other people's brains is so that people can find ways to live forever. Um, and you see it in human nature, too. Uh, Patricia Arquette's character has body hair and it's gross and it's the thing that prevents her from, like, reaching true happiness is this perceived, like, gross... Uh, like facet of her body he hates bodies i right. think the house is less about the body because there's so much else about in the film that's about the body like sure philip seymour hoffman's character caden is a hypochondriac i think that the movie is a lot about choices yeah. and how you don't know what choice will lead to what and i think the house is just maybe a representation of the fact that like the seeds of our own destruction are sowed years prior to our understanding of the consequences mm. like she makes a choice that ultimately leads to her death and you cannot know the end is baked into the beginning yes the end is baked into the beginning baked in is not the words that the movie, movie uses, uses but <laughs> uh, but they do have a line something the, to that. there is like, a line almost exactly like that i yeah. forget what the specific line is i think i have it, it might literally just be the end is in the beginning yeah or the uh let's see if i can find it anywhere 
Yes, the end is built into the beginning. Built, okay. Yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, she buys the house early in the movie, and then it fucking kills her. Yeah, sure, that's that's perfectly valid. And I, I mean, it seems kind of obvious that the house is going to kill her, but it's like, you kind of just have to buy the house, because it's cheap, and it's great for a single person. My, my other theory that I'm not as convinced by is yeah. that the fire represents, like, sexual desire, okay. since this is the woman who, who Caden ultimately ends up yeah. falling in love with. I was going to say, Kaufman loves redheads. So many redheads in these movies. I <laughs> think... I think Kaufman loves Catherine Keener. <laughs> that's true, but I wasn't even talking about her being the redhead in this movie. No, that, that's true. She's not a redhead in this. No, movie. but Kaufman does, I think, love Kathy Keener, and I think he wants Kathy Keener to just degrade him. <laughs> yeah, she always plays like just the sexy Stern, woman who will rude. not give you what you want. Yeah, and maybe no, hot because never of never more so than in being John Malkovich. Yeah, just kind completely of completely unavailable. Bullies the shit out of both. People John who are Cusack, attracted to Cameron him. Diaz, probably even John Malkovich a little bit. Yeah, and it's just like, God, I wish. If only <laughs> <laughs> we've spiraled immediately. We talked about one smart thing, and we're like, damn, Kathy Keener, hot. No, but I'm glad that we touched on the house because I think that's a really great example of uh, Charlie Kaufman's writing style and something that you see in a lot of his movies yeah. is like metaphors that never completely explain themselves. No. And, and that Charlie Kaufman very fucking weird. in interviews will refuse to explain or tell you if you're correct. I mean, like, I don't think he believes in the idea that like a his interpretation correct. is correct. Yeah. So I think he really just loves filling his movies um, and especially Synecdoche with just weird rich shit. symbolism, weird shit, dream logic that doesn't necessarily have a defined answer. meaning or yeah. answer behind it, but just is like creates a lot of fodder for Wants you to you create to your own yeah. interpretation for. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think is why i mean we're not going to talk about how uh i'm thinking of any things yet i find it so interesting that you don't like that movie because that movie is just that it's well, just rich symbolism i have gone on record on this pod that i am a basic bitch when it comes to movies <laughs> i like a plot that i can follow and i like it to be character driven but and out of the, out of the three movies that kaufman has directed you got anomalisa synecdoche yes. and i'm thinking of ending, ending things. things anomalisa is the most normal you can really? pause you think anomaly oh yeah. anomalisa is the most normal. An anomalisa yes, yes, yeah yes. you can pause it at any point ask me what's happening i'll have an answer for yeah. you i can tell you what's going on sometimes it's weird but it all makes sense yeah sometimes um, his face yeah. falls off but whatever that's fine <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking of ending things you can pause the movie at almost any point and i would not be able to tell you what is actually <laughs> happening other than like literally just describing what's in the frame like yep the dog is shaking for a long time yeah or like they're in a car i don't know what's happening it's for a all moment. dream logic and i think synecdoche strikes a really good balance mm. where i know what's going on but there's also just Rich a subtext. ton of like stuff going on often just in the background mm -hmm. not drawing attention to itself well, um, going that you can pick up on tying i'm thinking of anything's back to synecdoche mm -hmm. Charlie Kaufman loves playing around with time. He's obsessed with time because he's obsessed right. with death and the idea that you only have so much time to make your decisions and you only have so much time uh, that because you live in a flesh sack. Your flesh sack <laughs> breaks down and it only allows you so much time in this world. Both Synecdoche and I'm Thinking of Ending Things have a really loose connection with time especially cinematic time you have a certain expectation of a film telling you when time is passing you'll generally get like a cut a hard cut to a calendar or someone making mention of time's passing or you'll get like a dissolve or a fade to let you know that time is passing there are very few clues i mean there are almost no clues as to where you are chronologically in the narrative in i'm thinking of ending things um right. but in synecdoche it's basically just you have to pay attention to the way Caden looks or how characters I look. I mean, especially in the opening scene of Synecdoche. And I think I like it in Synecdoche more than I do in I'm Thinking of Ending Things yeah. because it's just more clear to me what's happening. I yeah. think that Kaufman is is saying pretty much as you just said, that like time starts to slip away. And it, it especially rings true during quarantine. Yeah. Where it's like everything <laughs> just blends together. You see um, Caden check the milk. It expires October 20th. Yeah. The next the next shot he's looking at a newspaper it's november 6th yeah you see christmas decorations in it's the up, background yeah. you hear on the radio um old, old, lang, old lang, lang sign sign which means yeah, yeah. i mean yeah, new no. year's song and then it keeps going it's he's at the doctor in march for an injury that he must have gotten in like yeah a long time ago. november and literally if you're the first paying thing you hear on the radio is that it's the beginning of fall of which autumn, would be yeah. in what september which 
Right, probably. So, like, like even in the first October, scene, maybe. just, like, you have no sense of what time is where. Yeah, like, and it's done so well, because you don't even notice that on your first watch through, yeah. probably. I know that I didn't. It just, it's presented to be one morning, or maybe one day. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it's making a statement about how all of his days are exactly, exactly the, the same, same, and years just slip, slip by. away. And, I mean, I think that ties in very neatly to another one of his themes of, like, just regret and like cowardice being so or cowardice specifically being so if there's I, we said this about bay that bay hates cowardice i think charlie <laughs> kaufman hates cowardice more because you only have so much time on this earth so you need to like capitalize on the time you have you don't have time to regret your decisions because that kind of just eats away at you and renders you unable to actually live out whatever like dreams you have or achieve whatever you'd like to achieve there's no reason to waste time being like regretful or anxious you just have to do the things because your time is so finite right right and that i think is reflected in in the relationship that Caden has with his wife yeah Whereas she is also an artist, and she, whereas Caden is making this enormous, unbelievably big theater piece, and it's yeah. making him miserable and killing him, um, his wife is paints like tiny, tiny, tiny little, little things, the paintings. smallest little paintings you've ever seen. Yeah, and she becomes very successful, and she's very happy. But it, interestingly, she dies before Caden does. Yeah, almost everyone does. That's Literally true. every yeah. main character, I think, die, except for, um, what's her name? Um, Diane Weist's character, who comes in towards the end and plays Caden towards the oh, end. Oh, right, yeah. She doesn't die before The OG him. Ellen. Yes. <laughs> Maybe, question mark. Un unknown. <laughs> but, um, yeah, everyone else dies before him, even though, like, he's the one who's most obsessed with death. Keeps saying, I think I'm dying. Or, yeah, like, and I think it's... it's it's very interesting that we see Caden obsess over his health and like examine his body. His, his stool and yeah. his body. But he's also not particularly observant because we see him pee brown bile into the sink. Yeah, sink into the sink. And I was not say even notice blood. And he yeah. And he lives I mean, longer than anyone else we see in this movie, pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's very interesting that we see him like waste his years in misery for yeah. literally no reason when his wife was just happy to make little tiny art, yeah. not worry about her health. Well, I think and then his decision to make something so massive is a reflection of his anxieties. He's so scared to actually like put himself out there or like rep like be his most authentic self. So he keeps making more and more ambitious projects, kind of probably subconsciously understanding that this will never get done. This can't be. We will never be, we will rehearse this for 17 years, 20 years, my entire life, and no one will see it. <laughs> it just, I will never finish this. So I never have to show it to anyone. And so it will never be. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I think it, we also see that Caden is less miserable when he's busy. We yes. see that with his love for cleaning. And I think that maybe the theater piece is an extension of that, where yeah. it's like not even about the the destination, it's really. It's just something for him to obsess over and not think about how he's going to die. I Except when he cleans yeah. a room, he can actually be finished with it and have a clean room. Whereas with this theater piece, which reflects life, it can always get bigger it's a, and more yeah. complicated because then he has to cast himself. Then he has to cast, cast the actor some, playing, playing that himself. himself and so on and so on. What was I going to say? I think that's an interesting interpretation of the cleaning. I thought... And maybe it's just because I had seen Human Nature and I'm thinking of anything so, like, close to when I saw it. Because Human Nature, there's the main, one of the main characters played by Tim Robbins. Um, Tim Robinson? Tim Robbins. I think it's Tim Robbins. Yeah, Tim Robinson, I think, is the comedian who does... I think so. Who uh, uh, I, think you should leave. I think you should leave. And Tim Robbins was the main character in Shawshank I'm Production. thinking of you leaving. I'm thinking of ending you being here. I don't know what Stop I'm trying talking. to do here. Stop talking right now. <laughs> My brain is going to fucking they're, break. They're, they're not all going to be great. winners. Every once in a while, there's a stinker. Um, anyways, Tim, <laughs> Robbins's Tim Robbins' character in Human Nature is obsessed with manners and trying to uh, exert control and, and having things orderly and clean. And it's kind of mentioned or alluded to the fact that it's him trying to exert control 
over things, and that is made explicit in I'm thinking of uh, I'm I'm thinking of ending things where Tony Collette's mother, uh, Tony Collette's mother, Tony Collette, Jake's mother, Jesse Plemons' mother, mm -hmm. says something to the effect of, "Oh yes, he's always trying to keep, he's trying to micromanage and be in control of things because he's able to exert control. It gives him some th some authority over something." I think the cleaning is him trying to exert control over his own life. He frequently says, "Like I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing." He wants direction. <laughs> he, he asks Hazel to tell him what to what do, to do at many points in the movie. And I think cleaning is the one way he's able to exert control over his own life because, I mean, he's able to finally, like, have something to do. He knows what to do. He can, like, rein in shit. And it, it's just a rote task. I think yeah, that's I'd why buy he that. does it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I That was... I remember the first few times I watched him, like, why... Why is why is this a thing? Why is Charlie Kaufman showing me this repeatedly? Why does he pretend to be Ellen to clean Adele's fucking hotel room? I think it's just some control. He needs something. He needs direction because that's when he finds peace at the end. Is when he's he says like artistically, I am burnt out. I've run out of ideas, and he finally finds peace. When he's able to put himself in someone else's shoes, yes. When, and when he decides to play Ellen. Yes. And he has an earpiece. But he in, has yeah. direction. Someone is literally telling him what to do. I think at the end of the day, he just needs to feel like he know he's in control of something. And I think that's why he likes to play director, too. Mm -hmm. He just needs to exert some control over his own life. When he feels like everything is spiraling, slipping, and he has no idea what the fuck he's doing. What do you make of of the Ellen stuff? Do you think it's like a what trans mean, metaphor? Man. What do you mean? What is, what is Kaufman trying to say? With, oh, if there's ever any regardless of what he's trying to say, yeah. I think we've established that he's trying to just throw a bunch of shit at us for us to make something out of it. Well, I mean, that's out of all the yeah. gender stuff because there's also oh, a point where yeah. where um, Philip Seymour Hoffman starts having a seizure and calls nine one one, and they're like, "Ma'am." Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, I, when he calls 911, they, they address him as ma'am. Right I, after his conversation with Catherine Keener on the phone, where she thought that he was Ellen. Oh, I never... See, I picked up on some... I mean, obviously, there's the overt trans narrative in being John Malkovich, where right. Cameron Diaz says, I think I'm a transsexual, which I guess was more... I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I mean, the language in the I, I don't know what was the preferred language in the 90s, and I don't know if trans activists were saying already at that point, like, trans se transsexual is not the preferred... I don't know, but, like, that's what they were saying back then, and there's, in human nature, I mean... Patricia Arquette's thing is that she has immense body hair that makes her look like a man mm -hmm. or that becomes more masculine. Um, and I'm pretty sure the only gender stuff I saw going on in, um, in before you pointed out in Synecdoche was um, Olive accusing um, Caden of being a homosexual. Right, right. <laughs> and demanding that he say that he's a homosexual. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't make anything out of the trans narrative other than him not knowing who he is. Truly. Yeah, I mean, I think it, maybe it's just that gender is like another layer of identity that yeah. we take for granted. Whereas one theme of this movie is that like everything that makes us us is pretty arbitrary and is a result of random choices that we could have made like 20 years ago, having no idea how they would impact us today. But I literally never even picked up And that up gender that. is maybe an element of that. The, I think... It's not the f film of his where I thought that it's not the film of his that I thought was least concerned with gender or sexuality because I mean there is like repeatedly I think um, Hazel also asks him if he's into men or women or or someone. Oh, it's does. it's not Hazel. It's the woman who plays Hazel who accompanies right. him to right. his his mother's, mother's funeral. funeral. Yeah. Who asks him if he's into women or men? And he says that he wishes that he was he was beautiful like her. Oh yeah, and she does ask, "Do you sometimes wish you were a woman?" And then mm. he says, "Yes, I, I think sometimes my life might be easier if I were a woman." And she's like, uh, "Being a woman's not not always the easiest, my friend." Yeah, but the the one strike against it being a trans <laughs> narrative for me, at least, and maybe this is me overanalyzing, is mm -hmm. the very beginning. When they're talking about plumbing mm -hmm. in the car, do you remember this yes, part? Yes, I do. And Caden says that a plumber is a man, and, and then Catherine Keener says, or, or a, woman. a woman, and then and Philip Seymour Hoffman says, he is a man or a, a woman. woman. 
And I think he is a man or a woman is about Philip Seymour Hoffman and somehow indicates that he is a man even when he's a woman. Well, it's still, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm reading into it too much. I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, if anyone's writing begs you to rip apart every line, it's it's Kaufman. Mm-hmm. But I, I, that to me is still too slippery for me to make any pronunciation. I'm not, I'm not really convinced by it either. No, but I thought it was interesting. There are so much still that I, I think is more. I mean, needs to be unpacked from this idea of just like the film's obsession with bodies and our bodies as like vessels through time, the film's just analysis or just, I, I'm so interested in just the film's conception of time. I know we already talked about it, but just the way it kind of slips through time is so fascinating to me in that like most, I think a lot of his movies are, invested in the idea of movies even if the films yeah. themselves are not about like movies themselves they're about art or well, he's extremely play... famous for that for his movies yeah. being self-referential yes and having a, a, a quality of a fractal being fractal yeah. like yeah but this movie i think is fascinating for me in how it understands it's a movie without talking about movies like it's not making overt references to other films at any point it's not talking explicitly about movies it's about art it's about theater and painting but it's not about film and yet it so understands how it's a film and it plays around with our understanding of how film time is supposed to be expressed and Mm -hmm. it's just like fuck you no (laughs) i i'm going to take your expectations and use your understanding of film knowledge against you in order to talk about time. And I think that's fascinating and wonderful. And I think one of the reasons I love it so much is the reason it could be frustrating on first watch is you just like, when the fuck am I? Where the fuck am I? I thought (laughs) this was a week ago, but I thought maybe a week has passed and Caden said a week passed, but Hazel is saying a year has passed and I don't know when I am in this movie and I don't know if I'm supposed to trust Hazel or if now Caden's just an unreliable narrator or what. It's just very frustrating on first watch, but the more you watch it, the more you're like, no, this is actually really interesting and smart and I'm a dummy. Well, yeah, I think in a big way it's supposed to be a representation of like Caden specifically his internal experience of yeah, the and world I just, I externalized think, which is that yeah. like time doesn't always feel linear you know some yeah. <laughs> some hours feel longer than others and same for for weeks and, but and just, years I, I maybe I'm just trying to gush here the way it's expressed is so it's great it's I agree smart. with you yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just really fucking <laughs> smart man it's really good um oh another thing I noticed uh-huh. in this movie and in a lot of his movies I don't think we talked about how much of his movie is about communication. People just not oh, hearing yeah, each yeah. other, not being able to understand each other, needing like elaboration or needing people to clarify themselves. In this movie, especially, whenever he goes to the doctor's office, especially doctors, he just he's like, "I need to see an ophthalmologist," or the doctor says he needs to see an ophthalmologist, and he's like, "An optometrist." No, an ophthalmologist. No, why would you need an optometrist? Yeah, or it's <laughs> just like, what do you mean? He's like, do you mean like morally? What do I mean? Or do you mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's just like, right, right. so many people try to communicate with one another in these movies and they either can't hear each other or they can't find the right words or they argue about Which is just, something that you, you rarely see in other movies, the, which is so central to human communication is yeah. like people not understanding exactly what you're saying. And I think he does that in a really realistic way. And especially you see that in I'm Thinking of Ending Things, oh, where yeah. most of the movie is conversation and those yeah. conversations all feel supernatural and realistic. In I'm thinking of ending things. Yeah, and I'm thinking of ending things. I think those conversations are the least. Well, well natural. sometimes I, I mean in the way that they misunderstand. Oh, and, I mean yes. sometimes it gets like really heightened and crazy, like when yes. when she's doing the film review and oh, when she's doing the Pauline Kale an on uh, Woman Under the Influence. Yeah, yeah. So obviously there are moments where it goes nuts. But yeah. There are also plenty of moments where it really feels like this is actually how people, people trying do to communicate. Talk. There are grounded scenes where they're having normal conversations in the car, and I yeah. totally buy those. I I mean, the only other directors I can think of who have people frequently just being like, what are you talking about? Is <laughs> like the Coen brothers, especially the Big Lebowski, right. where it's just like, what? Donnie, what? <laughs> and like that's played for laughs, but here it's almost like played for horror. People not being able to understand each other is like, 
really fucking stressful. Right. And I think that goes back to the gender uh, conversation that we were having earlier, where people not being able to understand uh, Caden's gender. They see him and they think that he's a woman. yeah. They hear him and they think that he's saying something else. He just can't connect with anybody. Interesting. I would... I just... I... There were so many other avenues to explore on this film, and I mean... I just think that's such an interesting lens to view this film. I, I'd have to ask like trans identifying people what they think of this. As, yeah, right. <laughs> definitely. I've seen like Alita Battle and Angel taken up as like a massive like trans favorite. People think that movie's a wonderful trans narrative. Right. I assumed if we were going to talk about any film as a trans narrative in his oeuvre, it would have been John Malkovich. Being John Malkovich is another big one. Because it's all yeah. about women getting in the heads of men and physically acting out as men which right. interesting as hell but i would i i don't know i truly do not know what to make of the trans shit in in uh synecdoche new york i i i wish i had something to add but yeah no i don't, I don't really know what to make <laughs> of it either it's just something that that stood out to me and i thought it was really interesting i was gonna say what do you think is the central Broad strokes. Let's take a step back. Do you think this movie is hopeful or not, Synecdoche, I'm talking about? Like, is this a hopeful film? What do you think the arc of Caden's character is? Um, I don't know. The The first <laughs> time that I watched it, I found it very depressing. Oh, yeah, because he dies at the like very end. Unbel- well, I mean, plenty of people die at the end, but, like, his life is so fucking sad, and then he dies at the end. Yeah. He can't get forgiveness from his daughter. Even though he didn't do anything wrong. But also, it, arguably, we see the movie from his point of view. And once yeah. again, it is his internal thoughts externalized. So yeah. maybe he can't see that he did anything wrong, but really, it, he did to her. Yeah. But anyway, he can't get forgiveness for that. He His relationships fall apart. He finds true love for one brief moment, and then that woman, dies Hazel, immediately. dies instantly. And then he dies at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I think it's about how we're all lonely. About how, like, these are yeah. universal experiences that movies very rarely talk about. You know, I mean, I, I think it's interesting to think of this as a horror movie, because most horror movies are about scary things that no one will ever encounter, and that yeah. truly aren't that scary. Yeah. Like, am I scared of a big gorilla snatching me up? Not really. <laughs> well, yes, it would be scary in theory, but that's not happening Right, right. I'm, I'm not scared... Of, like, a murderer, necessarily. What, what I'm scared of is wasting my life. And I think that's so true for <laughs> most people. And that's what this movie is well, exploring. I think... And I find maybe a little bit of comfort seeing that expressed. Because it's true. It's there, whether there's a movie about it or yeah. not. So I, I do like that, you know, there's a movie that's almost celebrating that. I think this movie's about a big dumb that idiot. That type of existential dread. You think Caden is, is supposed to be a big dummy? I think that's he, fair. I mean, I mean, that's that's he definitely is the butt of a lot of jokes. He is pretty inept and fumbling. I think he's intelligent in ways that people like to fetishize intelligence. Like he's perceptive. He's in in terms of like analyzing literature. He, okay, he art. literally got the MacArthur Genius, Genius Grant. Grant. So yeah. I don't know how you could possibly think that he's, he's dumb. He's very. I think that's almost a joke because he's <laughs> yeah. so like you like you said. He pisses blood and he can't tell. He literally asks um, Emily Watson's character, the woman who plays Hazel's double, mm-hmm. like do. You know what loneliness is like are you a fucking idiot do you think you're the <laughs> only person who's experienced loneliness he does not the first time you see him his wife is like i'm wiping olive's ass can you please get the phone he's like i don't want to he comes downstairs and his wife is like sorry for i tried not to wake you he's like yeah no you didn't wake me his wife tries to talk to him and his daughter's eating breakfast and he's just like Oh, this person died. Oh, wait, no, they won the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> he's just, like, kind That's, of a that fucking is very moron. Funny. Yeah, well, I think he's he's very smart. And I think this is something that Charlie Kaufman plays with in a lot of movies, is that, like, you could... Overthinking is, like, a special type of stupid. Like, yeah. you could waste your intelligence life. by thinking... By your, your whole your life, life, too. Yeah. By spending it thinking about, like, dumbass stuff, well, even if I, you are very smart. That, I think, is the central, like... I think that's what we're supposed to learn. I, I genuinely think synecdoche and adaptation to a certain extent are moral fables. Mm-hmm. Adaptation is about a man who's so enveloped in his own neuroses that he wastes 
so much of his time being unable to do the thing that he knows he can do. He can write, but he's just so wrapped up in his neuroses, his self-obsession, his inability to like reflect on anything other than himself that he loses someone who loves him and mm-hmm. he loves and he goes into like an existential panic same with synecdoche he wastes his entire life obsessing over himself his inability to like know other people he tries to maybe like like sub subvert his anxieties regarding these problems by saying I'm going to make art about other people but he gets so enveloped in his art that he refuses to actually engage in other people um and he's like too cowardly and involved in his own neuroses to talk to the person he loves who he knows loves him and he wastes his entire life the one he wastes almost all of his time he gets one night and then they die and that's all he gets because I mean, I think to Kaufman, or maybe I'm projecting, neuroses and self-obsession and self-loathing are a form of narcissism. Right. You spend so much time thinking about yourself, you, you obsess over yourself. That's narcissism. And I think that's the cardinal sin. You waste so much of your time in your life wrapped up in your own problems and your own self-loathing that you forget to look at other people and it winds up hurting you and harming and ruining your life, basically. Yeah, I, I like that you drew uh, a parallel to adaptation because in that movie too, there is a character foil who is the exact opposite and who is Donald way happier. Kaufman. He's played for laughs. He's kind of portrayed as this idiot. But but he Donald Kaufman um, to uh, Charlie Kaufman is like writing movies that are like nonsense th- that horrible. are that are meant to be bought. They yes. have like chase scenes. They have stupid, predictable twists. They have but bad they also, dialogue. Like literally, but he, don't make sense. He bangs it out in like two days. He sells it, and he's very happy. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing I think with uh, Caden's wife, where she is painting like little tiny paintings, yeah. not thinking about it too hard, and she's happy. Yeah, she just paints the women she loves, and then also both of those characters die. Yeah, in the movies. So I don't know what that means. But well, yeah. but they die kind of like fulfilled, fulfilled or happy. happy yeah like what the what is the point of a long life if it's a miserable life that's fair yeah it's a cautionary tale of the that's man who lives to be 90 years old but is miserable for 90 80 90 of those years minus a day <laughs> like what's the point you didn't live donald kaufman in adaptation is played for laughs he's portrayed as an idiot but I mean, Charlie is like, the girl you loved made fun of you behind your back. He's like, yeah, I knew, but I loved her and she couldn't take that away from me. (laughs) Her loving me has no relation to my loving her. And I think that's beautiful. That is really, that is such a beautiful part of that movie. You are what you love, not what loves you. That's what I decided a long time ago. So, I mean, you can make fun of these idiots who are predictable, but at the end of the day, if they have found a way to happiness, I think a lot of his movies are about the burden of immense intelligence. People kind of say that, and I think to an extent it's true, but it's a sort of fetishized intelligence because so many of these characters are idiots. Like to you and me, I think it's like, yeah, stop thinking about yourself so much. Just like... Think about other people. Think about how you're making other people happy or not making other people happy and just try to make them happy. And when you make other people happy, they can make you happy much easier. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's about the burden of intelligence, but it's also about these people are fucking so, like, just so enraptured in their own intelligence, so raptured in themselves, they cannot escape the bubble of their own neuroses. Shifting gears a little bit, I also... uh, it kind of interpret this movie as um, to be about the limitations of, of art in general. Interesting. Go off, King. <laughs> as in, like, Caden's piece, he tries to be honest, but in yeah. order to be honest, he has to include himself in it. Yeah. And in order to be honest, he has to include everyone in his life in it. And then in order to be honest, it has to get bigger and bigger until it's mm-hmm. literally just a reflection of reality. And then what is that saying? It's it's meaningless. Nothing, yeah. It's nothing. Can art ever really say anything? Can Is it even possible to express something true? Yeah. <laughs> Through what? art, and then I think that's really interesting that obviously the movie itself is yeah. a piece of art. Once again, going back to adaptation, I think there's kind of a reason why it ends with the joke ending. Like, he, 
Charlie Kaufman's like, I don't want it to be, I don't want it to have a deus ex machina, and I don't want it to have, like, a end with a stupid chase. And it literally ends with a chase and an alligator yes, deus does. ex machina. That movie itself does everything that it that says it not says to do. It says don't do. It has voiceover narration. Um, it's ditto um, synecdoche. I, it says something, um, oh, what was I going to say? I, I forgot, but, like, going back to adaptation, <laughs> like... There's only so much you can do within, like, a boundary-breaking art form. You need kind of the movie to end at some point. Otherwise, like, it can't be consumed by anyone. You were talking about Ant Kind. Yeah. Being, like... Charlie Kaufman's uh, new novel. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about a three-month film, but you can't watch a three-month film. It doesn't get watched by anyone <laughs> because it's, it's three months long. What was I going to say? I, I think... Caden's play is so big, like I said, because it's it's not meant to be seen. It's kind of just this thing to kind of like ref, not reflect, but kind of like deflect his neuroses or deflect. He he claims that he wants to portray real life, but he spends so much time in this manufactured world that he doesn't have to actually experience real life. It's a deflection. So he spends so much time rehearsing it because he's scared to actually show it. This idea of, like, having to reinvent the form as a deflection for having to actually, you know, bear a part of yourself. Right, yeah. I don't know what to call it other than, like, big dick energy on Charlie Kaufman's part. What do you mean? To, for, like, adaptation to make a movie about, like, how, like, these movie tropes are shitty and stupid and then include all of them in the movie and still have it be good. And then go to Synecdoche and make a movie that I think, in, in my opinion, is, like, kind of about how art could never, like, really reveal a full experience or be truly honest. Yeah. And make it a movie that is really honest and so meaningful. When, when the very movie is kind of about how that's... Not, not really even possible but it's not about like i mean it's about a lot of things it's of a, course it's about like time and death and in a sense love and romance but i mean it's not life it's not meant to be life um whatchamacallit like there's the bit in adaptation where mckean brian cox's character you right. know it's like what do you mean nothing happens in life people die every day people get raped shot people lose their jobs a best <laughs> a man betrays his best friend for a woman yeah brian cox is so good at yelling i forgot about that scene. that's very saying, similar to the scene where philip seymour hoffman is like you found the lump in your breast today you looked at your wife and you saw a stranger sitting next yeah. to you, etc. Yeah, <laughs> etc. Etc. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't think Charlie Kaufman believes in like no, not using any any tropes or anything. I mean, like, of course not. There's yeah. like a revolution that happens in Synecdoche, New York, yeah. that we don't talk. We Which, didn't talk about. Yeah, we haven't touched on that at all. And it took me three viewings to realize that in that that revolution, like so I think that also relates to his, in, his lack of observation. Right, exactly. Skills. Like he has the, no idea what's going on around him. He exits the the fucking auditorium one day, and there's like a line of people outside. Someone's like, "When is this going to open? We need to get in." And he's He's like, it'll open when it's ready. It's not ready yet. And he's just thinking about like, what should I name this play? Because like like, actual New York is falling apart. Yeah. And they're trying to get into Warehouse New York. Yeah. But yeah, I think that relates to Caden not noticing the blood in his piss is Caden not noticing the world falling apart around around him. him. Yeah. But what, what I wanted to mention is it took me three viewings to realize that in that scene you're talking about where they're leaving the, yeah. the theater, there are clowns who are stuffing people into a bus, and on the front of the bus, it says Funland. I never, what? (laughs) I I don't know what to make of that. I don't know either. I think they just had fun at the set department and the prop department. I don't know. I have no idea what imagined hellscape. There's also, like, a tiny, like establishing shot where you see a naked man in a collar being led that's around by same. a woman in that's, dress clothes. Oh no, that's a different scene, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and it, it's just like, I don't know, what kind of future is going on around these walls? We don't know because Caden's not even looking at anything other than his stupid fucking play. Right. You get no information about the obscene and insane changes in the future or what's going on politically because Caden is too wrapped up in his own shit to notice. <laughs> and that really comes to a head when Caden's, the actor playing Caden, I think his name is Sam. 
Yeah, played by, uh, what's his name, Tom Noonan, I believe. Yes. yeah, yeah. Who shows up in a lot of later Kaufman films and is very good. Yeah. He does all, all the voices in Anomalisa. In Anomalisa, except for Jennifer Jason Leigh's character and David Thewlis's character. Right, right. But, but he um, he kills himself. Mm-hmm. And he goes, you've never looked at anyone in your life, Caden. Now watch me. Well, now watch me. Watch Look me at jump. Me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Watch me jump. He says it like with I a smile you, whimsically. Hazel. But I didn't jump. I never jumped. Someone stopped me. Someone stopped me. <laughs> it's yeah. Great. It, yeah, there's just a lot of shit in this movie. It's very big and very crazy. Um, I also want to talk about the in the very beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. the first thing we see Caden directing mm-hmm. is a production of... Um, what is it? Death of a Salesman. Death of a Salesman. I don't know what to make of that. I didn't even give any thought to it. But with young actors. Yes. Um, and I, I think it's it's so interesting that he gives one of the, the oh, actors about the direction he gives playing Willie Loman. Yeah, he gives him the note that the he, tragedy is that we, the audience, know that you, the young actor, will end up in this very place of desolation. Yeah, yeah. that one day you will be an old man full of regret, and you don't yeah. realize it right now. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's it. Really hits different now that Philip Seymour Hoffman, Hoffman is is, is dead. Yeah. Um, and I think Charlie and Kaufman kills was killed himself basically. Was yeah. was aware of that. Not that that specifically was going to happen, but that one day everyone involved in the production He's of this die. very movie will be dead. Yeah. And that while they do it, the the tragedy is that one day, like this will be them. Like yeah. one day, this will be Philip Seymour Hoffman. You cannot not have regrets. You can't live your life without some regrets. You have a finite time in this earth. You cannot achieve everything you want to achieve. It, it's impossible. You will live your life with regrets. You will spend some time obsessing over yourself. And that that time you spent obsessing over yourself could have been better placed. Literally doing anything else. Yeah. Making yourself happy in some way. Right. So, uh, I don't know. Very fucking rough <laughs> tiny observation i made the final time i watched yeah. it um the first time you see hazel she's reading a book and i'm like oh what book is she reading swan way uh part one of marcel proust's in memory uh, or in remembrance of lost time or something like that oh which is interesting and i mean or in search of lost time i think is the title of the book that swan's way is a part of um, so that was just fun little observation. And another thing that you pointed out to me and how much time passes without you even knowing it, mm-hmm. the next time you, you see her talking to, uh, and, and Swan's Way is like 700 to, ni- I forget, either 700 or 900 pages long. It's very difficult and very long to read. And like the next time she's talking to um, Caden, she's like, oh, I just started the trial. Oh yeah, so she's, she's already done. She's already done with it. I'm like, how much fucking time passed in um, between those two interactions also that scene where Caden is looking for a signal for his phone he mm-hmm. can't get a connection uh, Ooh, obviously that's the pun but what he i also wanna... asks her to tell him what to say right <laughs> right right but but the, the the scene where she's in the box office yeah. um she goes she's sitting down and she says the signal's pretty good here and she moves her hand to her crotch and this, I don't think that's an accident. <laughs> I don't think so either. She's very aggressively flirting with him the entire time. She's like, she basically says like, please fuck me repeatedly. And he's like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. What does she want? What does she want me to do? And, like, what? and like his wife has been gone for a year. Right. He has not heard from her for a year. And he's like, mm, I don't. like, that's why well, I think she's a like, fucking moron. Kaden, she's been gone for a year. She's, like, she's been gone for a week. I got to get you a calendar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, That's that what is she a very says. insane line. I need to buy you a calendar. <laughs> but she's like so coy and playful the entire time. He's like, sometimes I get horny. And she's like, That's okay. And he's like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> and then she drives. I think that shot is maybe like one of like five shots in the entire movie where like, well, not maybe like. There's a cutaway to her driving alone in the and car, crying. crying. Yeah. And I think that's like one of, if you consider that a scene, there's literally no other scene without Caden in it. Everything is filtered through his experience. Or filtered through things that he could I see. Didn't, I didn't that's the that. only thing I think in the movie that, that like he couldn't see that we as the audience are shown. When she drives away after Caden does not smoke weed and fuck her, <laughs> that we see that's not filtered through Caden's observations. Yeah, I think you're right. That's that's very interesting. And I don't know... What do you think that means? I think it's the only time you get to see the ramifications of a choice that Caden makes and how it affects someone else. 
<laughs> the only time we get to see how a choice the kid makes affects someone else. Because every other time you don't... And I think Coffin just wants us to see the consequences of his decisions. Because almost everything else we do eventually get to see years down the line how it bears down on Caden. Right. How it like kind of just makes it... Immiserates him. But like, I think it's just so that we're clear, she loves him and wants him. And Caden is just being an absolute idiot <laughs> just cannot get out of his own fucking way for two seconds cannot stop thinking about himself another thing another tangent i i think it's interesting the way that the film like kind of reflects Caden's relationship with his daughter mm -hmm. I, it was interesting that you mentioned that like Caden doesn't do anything wrong i need to find my daughter your daughter is downstairs my real daughter, daughter. first of all he's an horrible stepdad i cannot <laughs> yeah. remember his stepdad. no he's not name. a stepdad that's his daughter oh yeah that is his that's birth his daughter straight up daughter and i think that she has one line i'm pretty sure she has one line if i stop playing with my pee, pee will you give me a nickel it, you're close if i doesn't play with my pee, pee can i have a nickel oh i'm so close that's her only line <laughs> that's ariel's only line poor girl which again i don't i'm not even gonna trans try narrative does she have a pee, -pee? Or is she? <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, the first time I heard that line, I'm like, is she a boy? It's I like, genuinely thought that the first time I heard that. I didn't the line. think about that. Yeah, that's a good point. Put it in, tie it into your trans now. <laughs> well, yeah. um, what was I going to say? But I thought it was so interesting that you said when Olive is dying and he's at the deathbed and Olive is like, I need you to apologize to me. And she's like making obscene demands, like right. you need to apologize for abandoning me to have sex with your homosexual, anal sex with your homosexual, your homosexual lover, lover, Eric. Eric. Yeah. <laughs> which is like, there are two ways to read that. Like one, he possibly did abandon her like she was gone for years and he didn't try to do anything until he saw that she got tattoos mm -hmm. when she was 10 which is on which is fucked up but like that's five years you didn't make any attempt to see her for five years dude you did abandon your daughter well we do see hit well and i also think that the movie takes place from Caden's point of view yeah so we see him call um they call katherine keener and like try to get in touch once yeah, that's that. I guess that is true. Once towards the beginning, when she's like, "I'm famous now," <laughs> and that's it. Just uh, like as the movie is presented to us, Catherine yeah. Kaner is more the villain and yeah. kind of forces him to not have contact with his daughter. But I also think that what we're seeing might not literally be true. Be the truth. It's yeah. probably it's like what his is happening exactly. Um, so it's like he doesn't think he does anything wrong, did anything wrong, and he doesn't know what to apologize for, which is a problem. But also like. <laughs> He's a fucking coward. She's like, apologize for having anal sex with your homosexual lover, Eric, which, as far as we know, never happened. And he's like, um, okay. And then she doesn't accept his apology. <laughs> can you forgive can you forgive me? No. no and then I'm sorry. She dies. <laughs> and then she dies. And he's just like, he cannot he lets her basically debase him. Which has happened before. I mean, like, it's in a more, it's in a far more playful way with Hazel when she's like, I want you to beg me for a kiss. <laughs> but he's just like, if someone asks him to degrade himself, he will. The plumber is like trying to fix his toilet. I and forgot about this. Yeah, the plumber is something I wanted to talk to you about. The plumber is like, I'm gonna, I'm fix, he's fixing the sink. And Caden's like, could you, could you please leave? He's like, I've seen boy parts before. What? <laughs> and then he just, le he lets a plumber bully him out of using his own toilet. And then he goes to pee in the sink. Sink. And like the one time he's, I think the first time he's pretending to be Ellen, some guy's like, hold the door. And he's like, you didn't hold the door. You didn't even try. And he's like, oh, uh. <laughs> he could have lied. He said, yes, I did. The button wasn't working. But he's such a fucking coward that he can never stand up for himself ever in this movie mm. he's he's a he's a spineless coward the entire movie and i think that's the cardinal sin is that he's narcissistic and a coward um what did you want to say about the plumber that's just that's no just just literally just the line i've seen boy parts before your trans narrative <laughs> really no i don't know maybe it just really <laughs> stuck with me and I, I don't know what to make of that it's like a it's like a weirdly intimidating line <laughs> yeah <laughs> um Okay, there's also a therapist character. No, we didn't even talk and I'm, about I'm wondering, her. yeah, if you have Played any by, thoughts about that. Um, I I don't know. I, I I don't know what to make of her other than the one scene on the airplane, which when the book just ends after he does not pick up on her advances. Right. 
Which I think is just like, yeah, Caden can never shoot his shot. She's literally lifting up her skirt to him. I offer you my ripe flower. Flower, and you deny it. This book is over. Like, that's it. You made a bad decision. You, you chose to make this decision regarding someone else in your life, and this is the consequence and of that decision. And now this whole other future is just done. gets erased. Yeah, it's, it's gone over. for you now. Like, yeah. that, I, I think, is the arc, basically. Like, he could have had a relationship with this woman. He made this decision because he was too much of a coward or whatever. He was too enraptured in his own neuroses and it closed that door to him forever Mm -hmm. i I don't know what to make of the line i I don't think i'm getting this book oh but it's getting you i don't know (laughs) what to make of that line it's a very odd line it's very scary um oh i also want to talk about little winky just a little bit oh the book little Little winky Winky is is the five-year-old author who wrote um a book about a man who joins the clan and it's about genocide and anti-Semitism. And then he gets killed, and then Little the, Winky killed himself when he was six author, years old. Five years old. He five wrote the years book old. when he was four, and oh, he killed himself me. by okay. the time he was five. And then we also see a poster for Little Winky. Do we see a poster Later for in the Winky? movie, at like a bus station. That. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and doesn't Caleb, isn't Caleb playing a character in Little Winky? I don't, I don't know. I know there's a bus, there's a scene at a bus stop where if you look at the advertisement on the bus stop, mm-hmm. it features Caden, I think, in a movie. Oh, maybe that's something else, or maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> there's a lot of weird shit. We didn't talk about how Caden appears in commercials for his own shit. Right, right. There's a, a little cartoon. Yeah, there's Caleb. cartoon Caden where Caden. you're falling yeah. and you've died and no one... Maybe someone <laughs> cried. <laughs> But, but not, not your, your one-time one time bride. bride. Yeah. Probably written by Charlie Kaufman, too. Probably. Um, there's another commercial, the first time you see Caden starting to obsessively clean, um, where Caden's in the commercial, and it's a commercial for medicine that makes you not feel so bad when you're going through Chemo. um, chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. But also, the, in that commercial, there's a scene of a mother and a daughter having a picnic, which is the same scene of Ellen and her mother having oh, a picnic. Yeah. And I don't know what the fuck Ellen is Ellen and her mother that. is another scene without Caden. That's true. The flashback. But I think that makes a lot of sense. Unless Caden is Ellen. Trans narrative. But uh, again, I don't know what that would even mean. But I mean. think that's more or less reflective of the fact that this is a time in Kanan's life not only where he's getting direction and someone's telling him explicitly what to do which is what he craves more than anything it's also the first time where he's forced to see or live the life of someone else forced to empathize with someone else and perceive a life outside of his own Mm -hmm. so I think it makes sense that the only two times are the one time where we see a consequence of his actions how it how his choices affect someone else and we see him forced to understand the life of someone else, forced mm. to play someone else. I think it's important that Caden, uh, Caden is a director, not an actor. He tells people what to do, and he forces people to view things from a certain point of view and play specific roles, but he himself is never someone who is forced to like understand someone else's point of view. He just reproduces other people's old work. He's not... Well, actually, that goes counter to my point. Never mind. I was going to say, he's not making anything of his own. He It would make sense if he was not making anything of his own, if he was writing his own plays. But, like, at the beginning, he's just reproducing someone else's own work. It is a pr- which he gets criticized, criticized for. Criticized He's not By his it. parents and, and his also wife, his wife and his wife's who tell friend him he does, all he, hated it. <laughs> like, yeah. It's derivative. It's someone else's work. work. Why are you doing this? Yeah. I don't get why the actors were so young. <laughs> the guy who plays his dad is, I forget what the character's name is in The Sopranos. In Sopranos, Hesh. Hesh, yes. Hirsch, plays, maybe? Hesh, okay. Hesh. Plays the Jewish uh, music producer, Hesh. Right, right. Um, yeah. Um, any any other thoughts on this film? Just real quick, I think yeah. the, the very beginning where, um, also speaking of the beginning, because the end is built into the beginning. Yes. We see <laughs> Catherine Keener cough immediately. That's oh, the yeah. first thing we see her do. She dies of lung, lung cancer, cancer later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that earned uh, Charlie the nickname Kaufman. That's why his last name is Kaufman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also her poop, Caden's uh, daughter, is green. Yeah. And she's very worried about that. And, and her name says, is Olive. Why, why is my poop? Yeah, Olive. Green. She also wears a lot of flowers. Yes. And is covered in flowers. The tattoos. Oh, yeah. She says, my poop is green. Plants are green. What if it's alive? Is, <laughs> and, is then, there and then a he point goes. There? And then he goes. It's not alive. And she goes. Everything's alive. Everything is everything. So I don't know. Maybe that is what it's saying. I don't, I know. don't know. I don't. I'm not saying that I understand it completely. I thought it was 
interesting, though. Yeah. Uh, I think it's fun how you see at one point Olive's like, what's on your face? And he's like, it's psychosis. And there's psychosis like when you go crazy like mommy or there's psychosis like what I have. It's you could spelled have different. Both. And she's like, you could have both. He's like, yeah, but daddy doesn't. <laughs> mm, maybe daddy does have both. Uh, just a fun, fun little thing. Um, this movie, if you weren't sure that it's about time, the first thing you see is literally a clock. You see his clock change to 745. That's right. Caden is checking clocks constantly. There are cutaways to clocks. You see towards the very end, one of the last shots is a graffitied clock. A graffitied on the wall. clock, yeah. So it's not moving. Time has stopped, but also constantly cutting mm. away to clocks. Yeah. Um Yeah, just tiny, tiny little things, tiny little no shot is wasted. Every line has a purpose. Everything you're seeing everything for a reason. Just interesting stuff. Um, before we end, do you think the ending is hopeful? I know we talked about the movie overall. Uh, I don't know. What do you, what do you mean? Like my understanding of the ending is one of Caden finally coming to understand. He's, I think this time when he says, I know what I'm going to do with the play, he does understand it because he's forced to view something from someone else's perspective. He has come to have a deeper empathy for someone else's life. Mm -hmm. You see him literally like walk through, there's like, he walks through like a plastic cutout. Oh, right. I thought that was maybe birth symbolism. Yeah, it's very Yannick. It's very vaginal, that image of him walking through. I think it's a rebirth. And I think that's kind of why it's tragic. Caden's character is tragic because I think towards the end, he is reborn. He does come to a greater understanding. And this time he does know how to do the play, but... It's too late. I don't know if I believe him, though, when he says, I know how to do the play. Because he says it so many other times. Yeah, because he says it constantly. So I don't know if that's I think it's true. just because he has actually seen from someone else's perspective. Maybe. I also think the Yannick symbolism is maybe saying that death is a type of rebirth. Birth. Because maybe. once again, the end yeah. is built into the beginning. I mean, you could see that. You could say that he should and have The movie a... also starts and ends with a gray slate. That's true. Um, you could say that he could have should have come to a greater understanding of on like other people's lives when he sees that final funeral scene that um diane weist's character like mm-hmm. directs for him where you have the priest i love giving that, that scene because i also think it's like supposed to be a joke like the speech i don't i feel like it's maybe supposed to be so over the top and ridiculous but i actually find well, it like really meaningful it. and it's, good it is kind of a thesis statement for the film right and i think kaufman kind of stages it like it's it's crass and it's expository and it's it beats you over and the there's head. like over the top music that's but just like pretty ridiculous Diane honestly. direction is meant to be taken as good direction and Caden like responds to it is like yeah this is better than anything i've ever and then, done and then the so rain think, starts and everyone opens their umbrella so i think at the, the joke time. is that like crass and like obvious filmmaking is not necessarily bad filmmaking mm. like unnecessarily obtuse filmmaking or heady filmmaking or just messy unwieldy filmmaking isn't good if you want to say something fucking say it that yeah that's a good point i think it's almost like uh i think like a photorealistic painting yeah it's like impressive but maybe it's not saying as much as like an abstract painting or at least like a little bit more of a surreal painting to use a painting analogy yeah whereas like the play that that caden is trying to make is literally just a reflection of real life it is not saying anything. anything from it right i think there's something like uh, there's, I know you don't love, I'm, I'm thinking of ending things, but, um, what's her name's character? Lucy's character talks about how she likes to paint and she paints yeah. like mood paintings. She paints exteriors, but they're kind of abstract. And Jake's parents are like, well, why not just take a picture? It's, or why not make it realistic? That takes technical skill. And Jake's like, well, I mean, then why don't you just take a picture? <laughs> and like, yeah, there's something like if you're just trying to make it life, just go outside. Yeah, and if you I, I love say that scene. And I'm it. thinking of ending things. Yeah, by the way. it's very. <laughs> there's good. a lot in it that I do enjoy. Um, I also, what was I going to say? 
I don't know. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't have anything else to say. That was that was it for me. Just oh right, right. I just wanted to say that yes. there is that line with the at the funeral with the insane music that we were just talking about, yeah. where he says like every choice, and this is the priest who's like doing the service at the yeah. funeral, where he says like every choice that we make could end up ruining our lives yeah. in 10, 20 years, and we don't know, and maybe you'll never trace it back to its source. And I, I just, I think about that all the time. Yeah, I mean, just it's... Just like how literally every choice that you make will have insane r- ripple and you effects don't know. that you can't even imagine. But you're always making choices. And it could ruin your life. And yeah. you, you'll never understand how or why that happened. I it. think that... There are different choices that you could have made that would have had completely different I results. I think that monologue is the thesis for the film. I think so, And too. it's presented as kind of this goofy thing delivered by a priest at a funeral. There are like five funerals in this fucking movie, in case you didn't know it was about death. Well, because there's that funeral that we see is immediately after the actual funeral, funeral. that happens. Yes. It is a production of the that funeral, funeral that Caden actually just went to. Yeah. I don't know. Movie's dense, man, but it's very fucking good. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, really did enjoy it. Um, the fir- My first watch through, I didn't it love takes it. Multiple... I didn't really take a lot away from it. I've yeah. seen it three times at this point, and I, Same. I like it more every time. Same. I'm, I loved it the third time I saw it. Second time, I was just like, this is very good. Third time is the time where I'm like, no, nah, this is... I was just not getting it all the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I'm thinking of ending things. Weirdly enough... I didn't love it as much the second time I saw it. Yeah, I... I thought... I still think it's very good. Chock full of very good performances. But I'm just like, yeah, I I got it. The performances are amazing. Yeah. And and I really do enjoy that aspect of it. But yeah, I watched it the first time. And like you said, it's whoops all metaphor, which is the type of movie that doesn't really appeal to me. And then I watched it again, and I felt the same way. No, I still really dug it, but not quite as much the second time. So, I mean, but hell, maybe, maybe it'll grow on me like uh, Synecdoche did. Before we go, mm-hmm. quick Kaufman rankings okay, for you. Okay, quick. L- like I said, um, I I think A Dangerous Mind and Human Confessions Nature... Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, yeah. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind yeah. are the redheaded stepchildren of Kaufman's film. Which means they're hot. Which in means a that I want to bang them. <laughs> um, a lot of Kaufman movies are hot. My hot take is that being John Malkovich is weirdly hot. Cameron Diaz and Kathy Keener. Yeah, it's going to be fucking hot. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> um, but every movie... John Cusack's also kind of cute. Don't love his hair, though, in that mm, one. But every movie minus those two, I really, really love. Uh, My favorites are probably human nature. Not, not human nature. I don't know why I always want to say that. I don't love human nature. <laughs> I think it's fine. Um, being John Malkovich, Adaptation, mm-hmm. Eternal Sunshine... Mm-hmm. I really, really love those. Those are the heavy hitters and, yeah, of his career. They're, they're, su- they're very meaningful to me. Mm-hmm. I saw them like at, at a time where like they blew my brain off. Um, and I really like Synecdoche, too. Synecdoche is very good. And Anomalies, out of the three that he's directed, Anomalies and Synecdoche, I like. Your most favorite. Yeah. Um, bottom, danger, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. It's not a Kaufman film. It's a George Clooney film. It doesn't Clooney feel film, Kaufman at good. all. Yeah. Um, I like uh, all the rest of them I like. Uh, I guess it's then human nature and I, something about adaptation, just weird. It does not vibe with me. It's so fucking weird. I love it. It's, it's, I think a little too far up its own ass. Of course. But like, it just, (laughs) it gets lost. But I think it goes so far up its ass that it pops out of its mouth and it sings a little song and I enjoy it. I think it gets stuck in the large intestine somewhere. No, it comes all the way up. (laughs) It's it's good. It's better than most movies, but not not my favorite. I mean, for sure, that's a valid critique of it. Because, of course, he wrote himself into into it. it. And And he wrote a twin brother for himself. Yeah. Um, I I just think Synecdoche is a better version of that film. Interesting. A much better version of that film. I think Adaptation is maybe a more accessible version of Synecdoche. I love Synecdoche. Um, for me, then, um, then um, being John Malkovich, early, fun, not amazing, but good. It's just hilarious and a blast it's from very start funny. to finish. I love it's very John funny. Malkovich. Um, what, what's mid-tier for me? Uh, mid-tier for me is Anomalisa... And um, blah, 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 blah. and uh, I'm thinking of ending things, and then top tier for me is Synecdoche, and absolute top tier is Eternal Sunshine. Yeah. Also, I, I I read his book and I love it. I think it's very good. This is a shout out, Ant Kind. If you want a <laughs> 700 novel, Ant Kind. You want to give a description? Tier. 
700 pages. It's about um, a film critic who who is the sole viewer of a three-month-long film that immediately gets destroyed. He has to reconstruct it. It's very funny. It, the writing reminds me of, like, Kurt Vonnegut or Douglas Adams. No, so for me, it's the way absolutely that it's, not going to fly. If you hate that, then... I literally... You named the two authors I maybe hate the most. May, okay, and I love them. It's, like, very... It's just... So witty and hilarious, and I I really really enjoyed it. The thing is, I don't. It's like not comedy. it's not really sci-fi <laughs> in the way that they write sci-fi, but there are sci-fi elements. It's just I thought it was very good. Very good. Um, yeah. Uh, final thoughts. Anything you want to say before you go? I I think we covered it. Yeah, I think, I think it's co- cohesive. I think I've reached the limit of of my understanding. Has Kaufman of this made movie? his masterpiece yet? Um, Do you think Kaufman's got a better movie in him? <laughs> this is, oh, God, I hope so. I feel like it's very hard to top. Yeah, he's done a lot of insane fucking work. Well, I think he's done plenty of movies that are on, like, equal Footing caliber. with each other? Yeah. I feel like they're all different. It's yeah. maybe a cop-out answer, but, like, <laughs> I feel like it's it's hard to rank exactly. Like, is Synecdoche better than being John Malkovich? I don't what know. What does that fucking mean? Like, how, what, how do you ascribe points yeah, to exactly, these movies? Yeah, exactly, exactly. What, what does that even mean? Um, yeah, just different strokes. If you like real abstract shit, you can watch Synecdoche and I'm Thinking of Ending Things and you'll love the fuck out of them. If you like, if you little... kind of can tolerate abstract stuff... Maybe just Synecdoche. <laughs> um, and then you also got Eternal Sunshine, which I think everyone loves. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't like Eternal Sunshine. Yeah, Eternal Sunshine or Being John Malkovich, I would say, are both great entry points yeah. for someone not familiar with for Kaufman. Sure. Alrighty, so that is Synecdoche, New York, and Charles Kaufman. Dan, where can people find you? People can find me on Twitter, at Dan Feingold. Anywhere else. Is there anything else that we want to plug there? Uh, commercial Boys? Commercial Boys. You can check out podcast. our other podcast where we review commercials. Yeah, that's and you can email us at commercialboyspodcast at gmail.com. You got it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Aaron Berkowitz, spelled like the 18th century politician who shot Alexander Hamilton. Um, yeah, I think that's it. We did it. Yeah, we Charles did it. Kaufman, Wait, who are we back. doing next? Do we even know? Um, Do we even fucking know? I will, we will discuss it and then I will edit it in. Okay, we'll leave a little message at the end. All right, (laughs) peace. It's official. The next director that we cover on first film is going to be Peter Farley. His first film, the film uh, which will serve as a lens through which we view the rest of his filmography, is 1994's Dumb and Dumber. Uh, Some other movies he's directed include Shallow Hal, Osmosis Jones, uh, The Three Stooges, and of course, Best Picture winner, Green Book. It is a very varied filmography. Peter Farley has just an insane amount of range, so I'm really looking forward to doing this one. I'm not going to make you any promises (laughs) about when the episode is coming out, because even if I did, you wouldn't believe me, right? So, if you want to follow along with us, just uh, explore Peter Farley's filmography, because that's what we're talking about next. Okay, looking forward to it. Bye. You're the one I've waited for Let's have some fun